Liquid Diets In the quirky realm of diet trends, liquid diets have made quite the splash, beginning as early as the 1820s, with Lord Byron's love affair with vinegar. Yes, the brooding poet not only penned verses but also guzzled vinegar in an effort to stay sinfully svelte. His method was simple yet stomach-churning. Daily doses of vinegar thought to dissolve fat as effectively as his poetry dissolved the hearts of 19th-century groupies. Lord Byron, weighing in at around 194 pounds, managed to slim down to about 137 pounds on this acidic regimen. While the diet did cut down his waistline, it probably didn't do any favors for his tooth enamel or his digestive tract, which had to endure the harsh realities of vinegar's pH levels daily. Fast forward to the 1940s, and the liquid diet evolved into a spicier, yet no less dubious concoction known as the Master Cleanse. Dreamed up by Stanley Burroughs, who had no formal medical or nutritional training, this regimen promised to detox the body and shed pounds fast. Participants were instructed to live off a brew of lemon juice, maple syrup, cayenne pepper, and water, completely eschewing solid foods for 10 to 40 excruciating days. Not only did this diet lack any scientific backing, but it also required a saint-like resistance to hunger. Celebrity endorsements in the early 2000s brought the master cleanse back into the limelight, with claims of rapid weight loss and spiritual renewal. Yet any weight lost on this draconian diet was largely due to muscle depletion and dehydration, a high price to pay for a temporary dip on the scales. Moreover, nutritionists warn that such extreme fasting can lead to a roller coaster of weight fluctuations and metabolic slowdown. Interestingly, while these liquid diets were marketed as revolutionary, they overlooked a simple biological truth the body's need for a balanced and varied supply of nutrients to function optimally. The Master Cleanse's spicy lemonade, for instance, might pep you up temporarily, but it's hardly a substitute for the complex array of vitamins, minerals, and proteins needed to power a healthy human body. The Tapeworm Diet Among the annals of bizarre dieting history, the tapeworm diet holds a particularly gruesome spot. It sounds like something out of a gothic horror story, but believe it or not, ingesting parasites to lose weight was a fad that people actually tried. This diet, which peaked in popularity in the early 20th century, involved swallowing tapeworm cyst pills. The idea was as simple as it was stomach-turning. Let the tapeworm take up residence in your intestines where it would happily gobble up part of your meals. The promise was that you could eat to your heart's content and still lose weight, all thanks to your parasitic pal doing half the digesting. But before you consider inviting a tapeworm to your next meal, consider the horrifying side effects nutritional deficiencies, abdominal pain, and a host of other unpleasant digestive issues. Not to mention the risk of the tapeworm deciding to migrate and cause potentially life-threatening problems in other parts of the body. Historical advertisements from the 1910s and 1920s show how brazenly these products were marketed, often disguised as a scientific miracle for the overweight and the desperate. One ad boasted, eat, 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 and always stay thin with a sketch of a woman enjoying her cake. Tapeworm not pictured, of course. The process of getting rid of the tapeworm once the desired weight was lost was another murky area. Some dubious treatments suggested a diet of mini pumpkin seeds, followed by a dose of castor oil and a hopeful visit to the restroom. Others simply crossed their fingers, hoping the worm would decide its vacation was over. Scientifically, a tapeworm can absorb around 500 calories per day from its host. That might sound like a handy helper for weight loss, but when you factor in the potential for cysts forming in the liver, eyes, brain, and spinal cord, that calorie-cutting companion suddenly seems less appealing. Fast forward to modern times, and the idea of using tapeworms for weight loss is not only discouraged, but also illegal in many places. Yet, the tapeworm diet remains a shocking reminder of the lengths to which people will go to conform to beauty standards or achieve quick health fixes. Really, if your weight loss plan involves living creatures that aren't house pets, it might be time to reconsider your dietary strategies. The Cigarette Diet In a twist that links one health vice to a supposed virtue, the cigarette diet of the 1920s promised weight loss through nicotine. Yes, long before smoking was universally recognized for its severe health risks, cigarette companies marketed their products as effective tools for appetite suppression. The mantra was simple. 
Reach for a cigarette instead of a sweet. The origins of this diet can be traced back to advertising campaigns by tobacco companies. One of the most infamous ads from Lucky Strike Cigarettes had the slogan, Reach for a Lucky instead of a sweet. It wasn't just about selling cigarettes. It was about selling a lifestyle where smoking was not only chic, but also beneficial for maintaining one's figure. Here's how the supposed science worked. Nicotine, a stimulant found in cigarettes, was touted for its ability to suppress appetite. Smokers would theoretically feel less hungry and therefore eat less. However, this benefit came at a colossal cost. Increased risk of lung cancer, heart disease, stroke, and a plethora of other serious health conditions. During the 1920s and 1930s, the cigarette diet gained traction among celebrities and the social elite, further fueling its popularity. Magazines and radio ads were plastered with glamorous stars who credited their slim figures to smoking. What wasn't mentioned were the long-term health repercussions that many of these celebrities would face, a dark side overshadowed by the glitz and glamour of Hollywood. Scientifically, while nicotine does have a mild appetite suppressant quality, the idea of using cigarettes as a diet aid is profoundly flawed. Smoking can increase metabolism slightly, but it does so by stressing the body, particularly the heart, which must work harder to manage the toxic impacts of smoke inhalation. Ironically, as the harmful effects of smoking became impossible to ignore, public health campaigns began to do battle with tobacco advertising. By the late 20th century, the narrative had shifted dramatically, and smoking was no longer seen as a lifestyle choice, but rather a dangerous addiction with significant health consequences. Today, the idea of recommending smoking for weight loss sounds ludicrous, if not downright dangerous. In the end, the only things getting lighter were the wallets of those who bought into this smoky scheme. The Sleeping Beauty Diet If you thought diets couldn't get any stranger, hold on to your nightcaps. The Sleeping Beauty Diet took laziness to a whole new level, literally sleeping yourself thin. Yes, this diet advocated sedation as a weight loss method, because if you're sleeping, you're not eating. Pretty simple, right? And just a little bit bonkers. Popularized in the 1960s and 1970s, the diet was reportedly a favorite among celebrities and those looking for a way to avoid the pesky annoyance of, well, conscious hunger. The theory was straightforward. By sleeping for days at a time, you'd miss out on several meals, hence reducing your calorie intake. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll himself, was rumored to be a fan, which might explain some of his less energetic late career performances. Participants of this diet would take sedatives to sleep for up to 20 hours a day, over a few days. Medical mm -hmm. professionals were not involved in this process, because frankly, which doctor would prescribe more sleep as a cure for a tight waistband? However, the Sleeping Beauty diet overlooks a few small details. 1. The human body needs food. It turns out, our bodies like to eat regularly to function. Go figure. 2. Muscle loss. Lying in bed all day doesn't just burn fat, it also depletes muscle strength. On the upside, you'd be too weak to make it to the fridge when you finally woke up. 3. Mental health. Prolonged sedation can affect your mental well-being. Turns out, being unconscious for most of your life isn't great for your brain, or your social life. Health risks aside, the diet also failed to account for what one might eat during their awake hours. It's not much of a strategy if you wake up from a 20-hour slumber and eat an entire pizza because, well, you missed a couple of meals and feel like you deserve it. The Sleeping Beauty diet gradually faded from popular culture, as more was understood about the importance of active lifestyles and balanced nutrition. Plus, it's hard to enjoy life's finer things, like, say, being awake, if you're always asleep. It's clear the Sleeping Beauty diet was more of a fairy tale than a feasible weight management plan. If losing weight were as easy as just sleeping it off, we'd all be living in dreamland. Instead, we have gyms, salads, and alarm clocks. Because unfortunately, the real world requires being awake. The Cotton Ball Diet Diving into the depths of dietary despair, we encounter the Cotton Ball Diet, a trend that shockingly does not involve a whimsical cotton candy spin-off. No. This bizarre diet literally consists of eating cotton balls soaked in juice, smoothies, or lemonade. The idea? Fill up your stomach with indigestible fibers which have zero calories and, 
unsurprisingly, zero nutrients. This peculiar diet peaked in popularity in the 2000s, particularly among teenagers and models who were desperate for a quick-fix solution to suppress their appetites. The trend was disturbingly simple. Pop a few cotton balls before a meal, and you'll feel so full that you'll skip eating real food. What could possibly go wrong with replacing dinner with your bathroom cabinet supplies? Well, a lot, actually. For starters, most cotton balls aren't even made of cotton. They're often synthetic fibers that contain chemicals processed for industrial use, not digestion. Consuming them is similar to eating your polyester sweater, except less stylish and more hazardous. The health risks associated with this diet are numerous and severe. Eating cotton balls can lead to obstructions in the digestive tract. These can be life-threatening and might require surgical intervention. Malnutrition. Since cotton balls offer no nutrients, relying on them can deprive your body of essential vitamins and minerals. Chemical poisoning. Again, these aren't organic cotton balls fresh off the cotton farms. They're often bleached and treated with chemicals. From a medical standpoint, any weight loss achieved through this diet is not sustainable and is overshadowed by the potential damage caused. The cotton ball diet is a dangerous gamble with one's health, highlighting the extreme lengths to which people will go to conform to certain body images propagated by society and media. Despite its dangers, the diet attracted attention on social media, where influencers and desperate dieters shared their experiences and unfortunately spread the trend. It serves as a stark reminder of the power of influence and the importance of critical thinking, especially when it comes to health advice online. As bizarre as chowing down on cotton sounds, the cotton ball diet is a real, if regrettable, blip on the radar of fad diets. It underscores the importance of educating young and impressionable individuals about the value of nutrition and the dangers of disordered eating practices. In the grand menu of diet plans, the cotton ball diet is one dish that should definitely be skipped. Living on light diet. Breatharianism takes the concept of dieting to an almost mythical level proposing that it's possible to live on nothing but light and air. Advocates of this idea claim that through a process called pranic nourishment, the body can sustain itself solely by absorbing prana, which they define as the vital life source in Hinduism, available from sunlight and air. The origins of this idea trace back to ancient mysticism, but it gained modern attention in the 1970s with the emergence of figures like Wiley Brooks. Brooks later founded the Breatharian Institute of America, asserting that he lived on just light and occasional junk food treats for balance. Another prominent advocate, Jasmuheen, formerly Ellen Greva, has claimed since the mid-1990s that her body has been reprogrammed by her brain to receive nutrients from a different source, other than physical food. She suggests that after an initial 21-day conversion process, involving liquid fasting and controlled breathing, one can convert to living on light alone. However, Jasmuheen's assertions have faced intense scrutiny and criticism, particularly after a few of her followers died attempting the initial fasting protocol she recommended. One notorious case involved Verity Lynn, a 49-year-old Australian woman whose diary revealed she was following Jasmuheen's 21-day fasting instructions when she died of hypothermia and dehydration in 1999. Scientifically, human biology unequivocally requires water, calories, and nutrients to function. Doctors and nutritionists point out that the human body uses energy in the form of calories from food to maintain vital functions and perform daily activities. For instance, the average adult needs roughly 1,200 to 1,800 calories daily to maintain basic physiological functions. Additionally, water is critical for maintaining blood volume, regulating body temperatures, and allowing cellular functions. The absence of water can lead to dehydration, resulting in kidney failure, confusion, and even coma. Breath Aryan promoters often cite anecdotal evidence or personal testimonials as proof, but no scientifically verified case exists of anyone living on light alone without eventual health consequences. Clinical studies by organizations such as the British Dietetic Association and statements from medical professionals consistently debunk these claims, citing the impossibility of humans photosynthesizing sunlight into energy as plants do. The enduring appeal of breatharianism may lie more in its spiritual underpinnings than in any feasible dietary practice. 
It speaks to a deep-rooted desire in some to transcend the physical needs of the body, reflecting broader themes found in many religions and spiritual practices. This, however, does not mitigate the dangers of attempting such a lifestyle, which can have severe or even fatal health risks. The Fletcherizing Diet Enter the world of Horace Fletcher, an American health food enthusiast of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, who earned the nickname The Great Masticator. His dietary philosophy, which shook the tables of Victorian America, was simple. Chew your food until it becomes liquid. Fletcher believed that excessive chewing would lead to better digestion and absorption of nutrients, thus reducing the amount of food needed to maintain health and vigor. Fletcher proposed that each bite of food should be chewed about 32 times, or once for each tooth, though he often recommended up to 100 chews per mouthful. He argued that by turning food into a liquid, the body would more efficiently assimilate nutrients, and surprisingly, it wasn't entirely baseless. Modern science does support that thorough chewing can improve digestion by breaking down food and mixing it thoroughly with saliva, which contains digestive enzymes. Fletcher's guidelines swept through health circles with the fervor of a new fitness trend. He claimed that his method could cure various ailments, from diabetes to heart disease, and even boasted about its benefits in weight management. Followers reported losing weight without feeling deprived because Fletcherizing, as it became known, made them feel fuller on fewer calories. To put it into perspective, a typical meal under the Fletcherizing regime could last over an hour, as every pea, piece of steak, and even beverages like milk were subject to the rigorous chewing standard. Imagine sitting at a dinner where your glass of milk came with a side of chew well before swallowing. Despite its initial popularity, the diet's impracticality was hard to swallow for many. Sitting through meals became a Herculean test of patience and jaw stamina. Socially, Fletcherizers could be spotted a mile away, not just by their robust jaws, but by their excruciatingly long meal times. Restaurants weren't too thrilled either, as Fletcherizers tended to occupy tables for hours, turning the dining experience into a marathon. The diet also faced criticism from the medical community, which questioned its exaggerated claims. While acknowledging the benefits of thorough mastication, experts pointed out that Fletcher's assertions about its curative powers were overstretched. Additionally, the diet overlooked other crucial aspects of nutrition, such as the balance of macronutrients and the importance of a varied diet. By the 1920s, the Fletcherizing movement had lost much of its bite, as quicker, more practical diets gained favor. However, Fletcher's emphasis on mindful eating and the digestive benefits of chewing thoroughly left a lasting impact on dietary practices. It laid early groundwork for what would later become more holistic approaches to eating, reminding us that sometimes good health might just start in the mouth. The Last Chance Diet In the 1970s, a diet emerged that was so risky, it was fittingly named the Last Chance Diet. This extreme weight loss method entailed consuming a very low-calorie protein drink as the sole source of nutrition. The drink, made from pre-digested collagen, was not your typical protein shake found in today's health stores. It was sourced from slaughterhouse leftovers that were unfit for conventional consumption. The concoction, marketed as Prolin, boasted it could offer all the benefits of fasting while still providing essential nutrients. The Last Chance Diet was the brainchild of Dr. Roger Lin, who in his 1976 book promised rapid weight loss for those who had exhausted all other options. The diet attracted hundreds of thousands of hopefuls, drawn by the allure of an easy solution to their weight struggles. Dr. Lin recommended consuming as few as 400 calories a day of his ProLin drink, which lacked many essential nutrients and contained potentially toxic substances due to its dubious source materials. Here's where the perils come into sharp focus. The diet's extreme calorie restriction and nutritional inadequacy led to numerous health problems. Reports began surfacing of dieters developing heart issues and other severe complications. The most alarming consequence was the link to sudden heart failure. By the end of the 1970s, the diet was implicated in at least 60 deaths. Despite the severe risks, the popularity of the last chance diet showcased the desperate measures people would consider for weight loss. The FDA eventually stepped in, and by the early 1980s, Prolin was pulled from the market, 
and strict regulations were imposed on similar weight loss products. This intervention highlighted the need for greater oversight in dietary supplements and weight loss aids, which until then could skirt the scrutiny applied to pharmaceuticals. If you enjoyed this video, please support us by subscribing to the channel. It means the world to us.